<clears throat> we'll pick back up on our study. <clears throat> Finished off about verse 7 or 8. We'll pick up there. In our class with prayer. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this day and for the opportunity we have together and study from thy word, and then to be a part of worship service unto thee. I pray, Father, that we'll have our minds centered on those things <clears throat> that will cause us to reflect <clears throat> on your will <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> will help us to grow closer and a greater understanding of what you'd have us to do. We pray, Father, this morning as we enter into our study that You'd be mindful and watchful of those who we're so, so aware of who need our prayers at this time. Those who are uh, struggling with their health, we pray for them and pray that the means being used to bring their health back might be effective, that they might be back with us. We're, we're mindful of loss of Brother Kenneth Osmer. We pray that you'll continue to bless that family and help us to encourage them. We pray, Father, that you'll help us to be able to have the right focus in this world in which we live, that we might be able to understand what we need to be doing with our lives, that we might understand what your word says and to live according to it. Realizing, Father, that being faithful to that, one day we'll be given a crown of life. We pray, Father, this morning that you'll bless us as a congregation, as we move forward, uh, fixing to begin a new year, help us to continue to pursue those things that will cause the kingdom to be glorified here at this location. Pray, Father, that you would continue to bless us, help us in our decisions, help us as we go about daily activities that we might be the examples we need to be. We realize, Father, that many times we fall short of what you'd have us to be. We pray that you'll forgive us. And You'll strengthen us and help us to have a greater knowledge and appreciation for what we need to do. I pray, Father, as we are going to engage in worship service this morning, that we'll be prepared to remove from our minds those things that would hinder us. We might be able to praise and glorify Thee and, and to worship in accordance to Thy will. We pray, Father, you continue with us now. I'll be with all those who are preaching the gospel the world over, especially those we're mindful of that we support from this location. We pray that uh, much, much good might be done. Continue with us all, Father, and help us to one day reach that goal of heaven, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. <coughs> I guess I better <coughs> hit the <laughs> cough drops early this, this morning. <coughs> <coughs> All right, 1 Timothy chapter 7, we're talking about the fact that, that Timothy is being uh, instructed by Paul to deal with false teachers, and that there's going to be people there that are going to try to hinder what he's doing, that will lead people down the wrong pathway. We talked about those who were engaged in uh, uh, endless genealogies and and uh, fables and ministering questions which don't do anything uh, and so he says you need to pay attention to those things that uh, cause godliness and uh, those things that would increase our faith not those things that would detract from that and he talks about those beginning with verse 7 there are those who want to be teachers of the law what's their problem though They don't know what they're teaching. They don't understand the law, yet they want to be teachers. Uh, you can't be a teacher of something until you have put the time in to develop the ability to teach. And, um, you know, it's, uh, 
there are some things that come to my mind. One of them uh, that is apparent to me at least, and maybe you've seen it on occasions, somebody wants to coach football, let's say. And so they, they say, I want to coach. And they don't have any experience. And so they, um, they, some, somebody says, oh, okay, you want to coach. I'll give you a coaching job. Well, if you put them in a head coaching job, you've got a big mistake on your hands because they don't know how to coach. And it's apparent in a few years that they don't know how to coach, and, or maybe it's apparent right off the bat. And you say, we made a big mistake, you know. You have to be involved in something long enough to understand it, to be able to be a teacher of it. And here we have people who were wanting to be uh, instructors in the law that did not know what they were talking about. Now, that's dangerous, isn't it? Um, it's, it's sort of a little bit humorous, but I don't know. You've probably seen those commercials. Um, <clears throat> the, the guys, uh, in, a, in some cases, are just different uh, scenes that they're in. But one that comes to my mind is the guys in the... Uh, in the operating room, and he's in there talking about how to how to do something, uh, brain surgery or something. And the guy says, "Are you a doctor?" He said, "No, but I stayed at the Holiday Inn Express last night." Well, I don't think you, I don't think that's what you you want to have doing those kind of things. You want someone who's experienced. Well, here these people didn't have any experience in the law yet. They wanted to be teachers, so that means they wanted to tell you what the law was all about. Well, you can't tell somebody what the law is about if you don't understand it. Now, we're talking here about the law of Moses. And it says that these people were trying to tell them what they needed to do. Now, one of the things that is, uh, is interesting if you study the Bible is that when you get to the New Testament times and you start talking about the law of Moses, um, do you think that most people that dealt with the law of Moses or, or were engaged with the law of Moses um, were really aware of what the law of Moses taught or were they aware of what the traditions of the elders and the, the, the chief priests were because what had happened is um, they had taken the law and they said well you know that's, that's a good starting point but we need to embellish on it we need to do something to it to make it where, you know, it fits our needs. So for someone to understand the law of Moses, uh, it, it was a, a sort of a mess. And they had to go in and, and um, to, to understand what the basic law of Moses was. Then you have all the traditions and, and teachings of the, the elders and chief priests. And um, those things were not necessarily true. They were traditions that had been passed down. So... This is something that's, that's, that's a, um, a difficult thing. To be a teacher of the law, one must have studied the law and one must know what the law teaches. But these teachers didn't have that. Now, they, they have a detrimental effect going in trying to be teachers of the law and not knowing what they're talking about. Then they're going to say things and do things that are contrary to the law of Moses. So these are difficulties that uh, we're having to be dealt with. Now, when we talk about the law of Moses and we talk about the law of Christ, were there things in the law of Moses that would be um, pertinent or could be part of the law of Christ? Now, we know sacrifice offerings uh, would not be appropriate, but what about the basic principles of the law of Moses? Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not covet. Were those the kind of things that were applicable and needed to be understood still under the law of Christ? Sure. So when Jesus on the Sermon of the Mount says, you've heard it said, as he quoted the law of Moses, but I say unto you, he gave an enhancement of the understanding of what the law of Moses' intentions were in the first place. Uh, because they had taken it and said, okay, well, I haven't murdered anybody but I really hate my brother. And Jesus says, you can't do that. And he says, I've not, never committed a physical act of adultery, but, you know. And, and so Jesus keeps us 
uh, in understanding of what was intended in the law of Moses. So there are things in the law of Moses that are still applicable because God hasn't changed. The things that were done that were uh, no longer done on the law of Moses after the law of Christ, those were things that were there to help instruct them to bring them to the law of Christ. Then, then they could be done away with. But the principles, the nature, the character of God is not going to change. So he still wants us to be a, a pure people, a holy people, uh, people that are not engaged in the things of the world. And so those laws are still applicable, and we see those teachings on the law of Christ. So as we look at this, we see that these people didn't know what they were talking about, very dangerous. Now he points out in verse 8, it's not that he's saying the law is not good. What does he say here? We know that the law is good if what? If a man uses it lawfully, if he uses it properly, it's good. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, but what happens is if someone doesn't understand how to use it or misuses it, then it's detrimental. Now, I'm not going to get on a soapbox, but I'll make a point here. The law is out of control today. And what I mean by that is we still have things that we're supposed to abide by. Those are good things. But people who interpret the law, people who are lawyers in a lot of cases, are lawyers that are looking to sue somebody. Hey, if you've got something against somebody, come to me. It's on television all the time. If you get hurt in an accident, we'll come and we'll sue the, the insurance companies or we'll sue whoever hit you or whatever. The whole point is lawyers have misused the law, in my opinion, in a lot of cases in the, in the world today um, to manipulate what they want to happen. For example, we have someone who's convicted of murder. They even admit that they did it. What happens today? They get a good lawyer. And the lawyer says, well, you know, but there were circumstances. And, and uh, yeah, they, they knew what they did, but these things drove them to do that. And, and so because of all this, it, 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 you know, so let's give them five years for killing somebody. And we read the paper and we just scratch our head. How could that happen? There are people in the world today who have, are making a killing, not just a living, a killing of manipulating the law to their benefit. And so there, there are things that are very uh, uh, scary and things that can be done that should not be, don't seem to be appropriate in the law we have today. So these people were misusing the law. He says the law's good in itself. Why do we have laws? Who gave us laws? Who gave us structure? What does uh, Paul say in Romans 13? That they shall not covet. Well, it talks about there, and I believe it's in chapter 13, that the law and, and the, those who are in power are there because of who? God. So God put order in this world. God intended for there to be things that we live by. And so it's not bad. It's from God. The law of Moses was from God. It has merit if it's used properly. Now we talk again about the scribes and the Pharisees and, and uh, chief rulers, chief priests, uh, the elders as they were called in, in some locations and elders of the people. These people had taken the law of Moses and said, well, let's do this now. Let's add this to it. This makes it uh, more meaningful to us or it, this has more strength or whatever. Um, so they made, they started manipulating the law. And that's a misuse of it. God's intent for it and how it was to be carried out was pure. And then man, man taints it. Man corrupts it. 
And same way with the Word of God today, the, the Gospel, uh, the teachings of New Testament Scripture about what we're supposed to do to obey God are tainted, they're corrupted because people will take them and say, well, that's good, but that's just not applicable for us today or we don't see it that way or whatever their, their reasoning is, they, they twist the Scriptures to do what they want them to do. But the law is good, and if it's used properly. Uh, verse 9, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. Why do we have laws? If everyone was righteous, would he steal? Would a man kill? Would a man covet? Would he do other things that are dishonorable? No. If he's a righteous man, he's not going to do that. So the law is not made for the people who are always obedient to it, but it's for those people who want to break the law. There are constraints in place that would impede what they want to do. And so he says here that the law is not made for a righteous man, but he says it's made for the lawless and disobedient. Those people who want to break the law, that's what it's made for. <clears throat> For the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers, murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, uh, that's for fornicators, uh, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for, for perjured, uh, perjured persons. And if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Now see, this is what is something that should be apparent to us. There is something that exists that's called sound doctrine. The teachings of the Word of God are sound doctrine. And so what he now is, is uh, portraying to Timothy is there's going to be people who are uh, embracing and trying to hold on to sound doctrine and there are those who do not want to hold on to that. These are the ones who are going to be, be disobedient to the law. And the law was made for them. Now, if you understand what, what happens over time and the examples that I've given to the laws that we have in our country, um, do you think it was ever intended when we established laws in this country that we let murderers go back out on the street? That was not the intent. But people have taken the law and said, well, yeah, but if you read the finer details of the law, it doesn't say this, or it doesn't say that. And so that means that if I come up and I, and I, and I capture that in an argument before and I convince some people, then we can have a little out. And so you see how things happen. In Old Testament times, with the chief priests, the rulers of the, of the people, the religious rulers of the people, the um, scribes, the Pharisees, some of those other religious leaders of the, their time would take the law and say, well, let me help you to understand that a little bit better. Here's what it really means, okay? And we have that today. In the times of the Catholic Church, what happened to the Bible? Did the average person have a Bible? No, it was taken away from them. What did, where did you get your, in, your, in, uh, un, excuse me, your instruction? How did you know what you're supposed to do? The priest was going to tell you, right? And so here we have um, uh, the situation there. Today in, in the religious world, what do most people do? What do most people listen to when it comes to uh, the Scripture? What their preacher says. Well, let me go ask my preacher. And, and so the idea is that if you look at what happens to something that's pure and is straightforward as God gives it, can be done, can be uh, carried out, can be understood. Now, not that we'd be perfect like the law of Moses. Uh, we couldn't keep it. Uh, in per to perfection and, and so it was more of an instructive law to bring us to Christ 
But the point I'm making is when God gave the law, it could be understood. It could be carried out. People could go implement what the law said. But over time, man says, well, let's, let's do this, and then this needs to be added to the law or whatever. So here, here's the dilemma. There is a thing called sound doctrine. There is God's teachings, and those things are supposed to be kept intact and not manipulated for us to be able to be pleasing to God. And yet, on the other hand, what we see here is the fact that Paul's having to tell Timothy there are people who are going to try to teach the law that don't know it. There are people who <clears throat> that are, are in violation of the law. The law was, was made for these type of people. Why? So that it would point out the inconsistencies in their life. It would point out those things that are contrary to the sound doctrine. And that's what uh, Timothy has to differentiate. And Paul is telling him there are people that are going to exist out there that are going to be involved in these activities which are contrary to sound doctrine. Therefore, contrary to the law of God. And so he has to pay attention to those and he has to deal with those. Now, I want you to notice this list of things that are listed here. These are things that are... <clears throat> Uh, sins of the flesh. These are things that are created by one's own lust. And so man is by nature uh, fleshly. He's going to think of those things of the flesh. To be able to, to be what God wants us to be, we have to crucify that fleshly side. Uh, that's not something that's just an on-off switch. So there's difficulties there. But there are people that are, he's pointing out here that their intention is to skirt the law or to do what they can um, contrary to it and yet still promote themselves as being okay. You know, that's sort of the, uh, just the term that I throw out there that we sort of use today. Well, I'm okay, you know. I may do this and that, but I'm okay. So he's having to deal with this. Now look at what he says here, some of the things that he, he talks about. The laws made for those that are lawless, that is, those who are disobedient, unruly, for the ungodly and for sinners. Now, we don't want to talk about that today. Let's don't talk about sinners. Let's don't talk about people who, um, who morally have um, abandoned what is right. And so we, we look at that and we, and, and we don't want to use those terms today. But for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, um, people who don't want to follow what the teachings of God are, who profane them in any way that they can, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers and just manslayers, those who would kill one another. There are people today who will kill their fathers and mothers. You would think that that's, that's, a, that's a foreign thing, right? You, uh, uh, typically, parents uh, bring children into the world, and their purpose for bringing them into the world is to take care of them and to nurture them and to bring them up to a mature adult. That's responsible, right? That's what the intent would be. Well, here we have situations where there are people who would go so far as to murder their fathers and, murder, and mothers. Now the indication is here is not, these aren't children doing this. We're talking about mature adults. Mature adults that would go back and kill their mothers and fathers. That, that's, a, that's a strange situation because at that point, once you've, re you've reached adulthood, you're on your own. You don't, you're not being told, baby, about who from your mother and father what to do anymore. And so you question, why would some of that take place? Don't know, but these are the categories that he talks about. Manslayer, just killing anyone. For fornicators. And, you know, this is something that is just, um, I, I don't know how you, how you do it to uh, explain this, but if you turn on your television, uh, it's going to slap you right in the face because everything now is 
the institution of marriage, well, that's okay for some people, but, you know, maybe you're not into that, or maybe that's not what you're interested in, but sleeping with uh, and having sexual relations with uh, other people and multiple people is an okay thing in America and throughout the world. We have looked at that, and it's going or gravitating toward the position that there's nothing wrong with fornication. And apparently, Timothy's going to have to address it here. They have the problem. It's always going to be here. But the point that he's making to Timothy and the, the, the words that are being said to us today is these are still things that are contrary to the law that need to be combated. And so he's going to have to deal with these. Fornication. For them that defile themselves with mankind. Now, I, I think that's pretty apparent. And we're starting to talk here about homosexuality and uh, the difficulties um, of man with men would bring, or women with women. Romans chapter 1, we, we've talked about that on a number of occasions. It's interesting this week, I didn't know if anybody's paying attention to the news, there was a junior ROTC instructor or something, ROTC instructor at Grissom High School who told his ROTC class that homosexuality was a sin. Did y'all hear about that? Wow. The gay and the lesbian and whatever this union is that they have, oh, they, they rose up. Now, you know what they, they said? That is harassment. He makes a statement that it's sin, and that's harassment. That's where we're going to in the world. Every time we start talking about homosexuality outside the confines of this building, when we're in public, then we subject ourselves to that kind of uh, treatment because they're not going to be quiet about it anymore. They're establishing unions or groups that are going to rise up and say, ooh, bad, foul, you have, you've said the bad things, you've said the wrong things, you've slandered us. And it's going to be uh, out in public this way. And so what do you have? You have, we've talked about this before, you have government agencies, which, who funds the government? We do. Government agencies which condone and celebrate Gay and Lesbian Month. And guess what? You're supposed to go along with that if you want to work here. If you say anything about it, they will escort you to the door. That's where we are. And here we have the same thing that is having to be dealt with here. The, pr the point that I'm making is it's not going to ever go away. It's never going to be right. It's not going to go away. And Paul instructs Timothy, and as he instructs those who would read the, the scriptures, that these are things that are contrary to God's law. And these are things that have to be combated. Now, how we do that, you know, we, we can be careful and, and do the best we can, maybe come with a means of being the best way to combat that. I don't know. But certainly we don't embrace it. And these are things we have to deal with. Uh, men defiling themselves with mankind. For men stealers, we're talking about slave um, Human slavery um, back then, uh, probably the way we would talk about it, it's, it's, it's so apparent today. It's so apparent today. Um, there are young people who are taken at, and you see these on the movies and you say, wow, that was a scary movie. Well, there's reality there. In some countries, young ladies are taken and made part of a slave group, they're sold, bought, for the purposes of prostitution. And, you know, now that the world is as open as it is, young men are not any exception to that. Now, that's shocking, but that's what the world is. So these are scary things, but they've not, not anything different than what Timothy has to address here. And, um, this, these are things that must be dealt with. Uh, Man-stealers, liars, for uh, 
uh, perjured persons. Uh, and he says, if there be any other thing that's contrary to sound doctrine, these are things you have to recognize and you have to know that those are things that have to be confronted and combated. And because what we're holding on to is sound doctrine. What your purpose as representing Christ is to teach sound doctrine, to teach the truth. He says, for these things that are contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel, what sound doctrine? The glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. So Paul says, Timothy, I have been instructed. I have had committed to me the gospel of Christ. And now I am imparting that to you as my son to, to hold on to that and to use that um, as your basis for belief and your faith and to teach against those things that are contrary to it. That's, that's the charge that I'm giving you. Now, Paul's not writing to us. And we can say that. Well, that was written to Timothy. It's not written to us. But the scriptures, the consistency of the scriptures are plain. As a child of God, then I have responsibilities. You think it is one of those things where, oh, I'm not Timothy, therefore I don't need to hold on to sound doctrine. I'm not Timothy. He didn't write a letter to me. So I don't have responsibility regarding sound doctrine. Can we say that? No. And so we understand the principles of what a Christian is about. Holding on to and uh, exemplifying in our lives Christ living through us. And we can't say then, oh, well, I, I w didn't have a letter written to me. Uh, nothing really applies to me today. So I can just sort of float along and as things come that are in my way, I'll just sort of maneuver around them and I'll never have to deal with some of these things. No. As a child of God, we have responsibilities to uphold sound doctrine, the gospel of Christ in our lives and in what we teach others. So he says, I'm committed to this. I was, I was given this as a task. And he goes on to say <clears throat> in verse 12 uh, where that came from. The gospel's being committed to my trust, verse 12, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath what? Enabled me. He has made it possible or he has pushed me in the direction that I should go and teach the gospel. And he has enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. How did you get into the ministry, Paul? I was put into that by Jesus Christ. He committed to me the gospel that I would be able to teach it and that I was counted worthy of that and he says I, I'm count that as a privilege and he says in verse 13 who who it's hard to understand perhaps he says who was a blasphemer that is he spoke against Christ and the, and the way and the gospel he was a persecutor and and he goes so far as to say that he was injurious what does that mean? He inflicted harm. Now you might look at persecution as going about and saying, well, you know, you people are, are wrong and you're, you're teaching the gospel and that's not right. It's contrary to the law that God gave us and we shouldn't be fought. We might consider that persecution. But when he says, I persecuted, and then he says, and was injurious, that lets us know that Paul inflicted some physical pain on these people. He did those things that were harmful to the cause of Christ. But he says, I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. I did it not understanding the gospel, not understanding. Paul was a great student of the law. And sometimes we, we look back upon people like Paul and we say, how is it that someone who from their youth has heard the scriptures and heard the prophecies not understand the coming of the Messiah and the fact that Jesus was that Messiah? Now, we understand 
the trials and persecutions that the um, Israelites went under, the Jews were under, uh, and that they were no longer a power and that they wanted to be restored to that. And so Jesus was not in their mind who could do that. He came and he said, I'm not here to fight. My kingdom's not of this world. Oh, well, you're not the Messiah then. So they're misunderstanding. But you look at Paul, a great student of the law, and it's like, how did you not understand about the gospel? How did you not understand about Christ? And, you know, when you're blinded by things, as Paul was, it's uh, something that you just can't see. So he did it in ignorance and in, in unbelief. And he says, the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. The grace of God is coupled with instilling faith in us. That's the purpose of the grace of God, to instill faith in us. What did we study in Titus? Grace of God has appeared to all men, teaching us that we ought to live righteous, soberly, godly in this present world. And so it teaches us, it instructs us, it creates in us a faith, and then it's coupled with love, overwhelming love that we have in Christ Jesus. That grace that will lead us to salvation. Now, he says this that he's been saying, and about the grace of God, he tells Timothy, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Take it and embrace it without any doubts. This is what we should be about. The sound doctrine delivered to us, the will of the Father given to us by Jesus Christ, that we should embrace it and understand how he's willing to save us through grace and faith and love, and that we should hold on to that. This is worthy, he says. This has great value. And it's a faithful saying. It's not one that is corrupted or false, but it's a faithful saying. It's worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. Now, Paul has just told Timothy about a lot of things that were contrary to sound doctrine, how people live according to the flesh. And yet in this wrap-up of what he's saying as an introductory to this, this letter, he's letting him know that he feels like that he has done some of the, the, the worst things that could be done. He says, I'm the chief of sinners, and yet God is going to accept me. Now, so if you, if you look at what Paul's saying, these people that you're going to have to combat over here that are living in sin, they're living in fornication, they're living in homosexuality, they're living in, in uh, murderous situations, um, they are liars, uh, anything you can come up with, anything that's contrary to sound doctrine, you put them in that category, and Paul says, I'm the chief of sinners because I injured the body of Christ. I injured the church. And so if God will accept me and allow me to become his servant, what about all these people that are living in sin? They too can hear the truth, can be uh, made aware of the truth and how they're contrary to that. And they can be made uh, in, a, in a relationship with God that's acceptable. And in some cases, we just, we, you know, we don't understand that. Because how do you take, uh, for example, um, there have been stories of people in uh, prison ministry where someone killed somebody, and then they understand because someone finally took them the gospel, they understood, they accepted it. How can they be saved? Maybe you have trouble dealing with that. But... Uh, you know, they're, they're, you have to understand God and understand what God is willing to do if we will, will renounce our sins and become a part of the body. Uh, I think 
Tim pointed out, maybe it was Wednesday night, I, I don't remember, maybe it was when he was preaching this last week or so, the fact that the very people uh, that were involved in laying the branches and what, what's referred to by a lot of people as the Passion Week, that when they had the Passover feast and then he was going to be crucified, the very people who were laying branches and garments in front of him as he entered into the city triumphantly at the beginning of that week were some of the same people who were screaming out crucify him at the end of the week. And yet, what happened on the day of Pentecost when Peter preached to those people? He said, you have taken it with wicked hands and crucified the Son of God. Was it over with? No, Peter says you can repent and you can be baptized for the mission of your sins. And so God is always standing ready for us to step away from the darkness of the sins of this world into the light of his gospel. And he's willing to love us and to forgive us. And Paul says, whatever these people were doing that were bad things, he says, I'm the chief of sinners. And God has granted to me the opportunity to be a child of God. And that's an amazing thing. I am chief. He says, I came into the world, as Jesus came in the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief, verse 15, verse 16. Howbeit for this cause, I obtained mercy. What was the cause? That in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering. I am an example of what Jesus Christ is willing to do for sinners. If you look at Paul, Paul looks at himself and says, but you know, I was sort of a, a worthless case. I, I shouldn't have been accepted. But he says, Jesus, he says, he gave me mercy. He says, he gave this mercy that in me first, Christ Jesus, or Jesus Christ, might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. I am an example. I am a pattern. I, I was totally against the church. I have persecuted the church. I have done harm and injury to people and to the church, the cause of Christ. But yet, Jesus was willing to have mercy on me and to forgive me and give me new direction in my life. And I'm an example of those who should follow as they look at the things that they do in their lives and things that would be contrary to what God has told us is right. And there is opportunity for salvation. Anyone that would believe on him. Verse 17. Now unto the king eternal. Uh, th this, this passage here is, is an impressive passage. And I think if <clears throat> we had time and someone had the ability to, to go and pull all the information, this would be a tremendous lesson. To the king, we're going to talk about a king here, but we're going to talk about the king of kings. What about this king? He's eternal. Every king that was on the earth, no matter how powerful, no matter if they, they were able to rule the whole world, no king, no king was eternal. No king was eternal. When you talk about someone that's the king, you're talking about someone with great power. But no king was eternal. There, here we're talking about the king who is eternal. Now unto the king eternal. What else? He's immortal. He's immortal. And he is invisible. Now, when you start talking about the God of heaven, how do you describe that to somebody? Well, they're eternal. Well, what do you know about eternity? What do you know about eternity? You don't have a clue about eternity. What do you know about being immortal? We're mortal beings. That's all we know. 
All we know is the mortality of life. What about being invisible? We'd like to be invisible sometimes. But what about being invisible? How does something exist that you can't see? Well, you know, we finally, over uh, scientific studies, figured out some things that exist in the world. It's a good thing we did. Well, we wouldn't have electricity, but what about things that you can't see? They're invisible. Who has that ability? We don't have that ability. Invisible. And the only wise God. It's interesting that the American Standard Version omits wise, so it would read the only God. The only God. If that was just resolved today in this world, that there was one God, that would create, uh, clear up a lot of confusion, wouldn't it? The only God. And Paul says to him, <clears throat> be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul recognized where he came from. And in the humility that's shown forth in this passage, he promotes sound doctrine, but also points out that he's the chief sinner and that God has brought salvation to his life. All right, next week we'll pick up here and uh, we'll finish on out 1 Timothy 1 and get into chapter 2.